It is commonly misunderstood nowadays that the historical estimations made by Scaliger regarding the timing of historic events has been confirmed by modern scientific dating methods. And this is very important because his estimations are practically taken as verified and proven scientific history. So it is worth investigating what this so-called history is actually based on. Is it science or assumptions? In reality, the idea that it is scientific is very far from the truth. And in this video, we will review very briefly the methods of carbon dating, followed by dendrochronology. To explain why this is so, carbon dating, also known as radiocarbon dating, is a method of determining the age of an object containing organic material by using the properties of radiocarbon, which is a radioactive isotope of carbon. When an animal or plant dies, it stops exchanging carbon with its environment. And from that point onwards, the amount of radiocarbon that it contains begins to reduce due to radioactive decay. Measuring the amount of radiocarbon in a sample from a dead plant or an animal, such as a piece of wood or a fragment of bone, provides information that can be used to calculate when the animal or plant died. So far, so good. However, the speed of this uh, radioactive decay is unknown. And um, determining that speed is not so easy, so the way they did it was um, by taking samples uh, from uh, dead animals or plants which have died at a time that is considered to be known for sure and then from that calculate what is the rate of decay of this radiocarbon. One of the main events that is being taken into consideration while making these calculations of decay rate is the eruption of the volcano near Pompeii which buried the entire city, along with its residents, under a thick layer of ashes. Good. However, the date when that happened was not really known for sure, but was taken from the Scalinger uh, timeline itself. It does not confirm it. It is taken from it to start with. You will find interesting information pointing out to the fact that actually Pompeii most likely was buried just a few short hundred years ago. More information on this topic will be covered in future episodes on the Roman Empire. Well, besides being based on the unknown factor that is the rate of decay of radiocarbon, to add to everything else, the laboratory equipment required for this method of testing is extremely sophisticated. And according to the opinion of the modern scientists themselves, it gives absolutely inaccurate results very often. Actually, to test a single piece, um, the proper way to do it is uh, to have it four or five laboratories uh, do it absolutely independently, and then to publish the results in terms of uh, a range, because uh, we always uh, get the results in, in terms of uh, uh, one suggested uh, time. However, the laboratories themselves give a very wide uh, range of time, but we do not get that information. We get um, what uh, some so-called historian interprets that time range to be. This documentary about the survivors of Atlantis will concentrate upon the last couple of thousand years mainly. And since according to mainstream science itself, carbon dating gives normally an inaccuracy range of some 2,000 years, that practically means it is absolutely inapplicable to the recent history anyway. Another problem with carbon dating is um, selectively taking uh, samples, which means uh, that, for example, a piece of bone is uh, found near a building, and is uh, used to find out the date of the building. Actually, 
it is absolutely possible that the animal to whom this bone belonged lived in a completely different time period and not at the time when the given building was actually built. Now a few words about dendrochronology or informally known as tree ring dating. The idea behind this is that every year the trees form rings and they are very particular changing according to the different climactic conditions. Different rings form, however, by different kinds of trees, and even the same kind of tree can be different if located in different areas. And that is why, to use this method to date a wooden object, we must be sure the wood has come from this very same area, and that it is exactly the same type as the one that the scientist as the chart for. And now about these charts. For example, we have a hundred year old cherry tree. To continue the chart further in time, we'll need to find another one that is 150 years old. Uh, so some of the uh, rings will be matching and in this way we can continue the graph 50 years further back in time. Then we'll need another cherry tree which uh, was slightly older than the one we have, so some of the rings overlap and so on and so on. What you see now is an actual dendrochronology graph. It contains many white spots. It uh, features few kinds of uh, trees and since they all must uh, come from the same area, these graphs are very difficult to make and because they are broken, they are not continuous, at the end we can see that dendrochronology is becoming a very subjective method of dating and it can be really used in very rare cases because the sample that is required must be big enough and uh, often when the builders in ancient time would use wooden locks they will actually chop off uh, a lot of rings on the side to make a beam and that will make the dating very very inaccurate because who knows when was the tree alive, when did they cut it, when did they use it, when did they reuse it. So to summarize, tree ring dating is absolutely a reliable and genuine scientific dating method, however its application is extremely limited. Limited to the point that it practically has no value in confirming this Caligarian version of history as genuine. Because all the white gaps between the black lines on this chart signify unknown period, then these unknown gaps are adjusted in such a way that they will fit the Scaligarian version of history and again we cannot say that they confirm it simply because they are based on it again. A great number of modern historic dating methods appeared in the recent years. Their sophisticated and very scientifically sounding names alone create the impression that many learned men have worked on this. In reality, they are all either derived from carbon dating or they are simply a variety of carbon dating. And that is why they all suffer from the fundamental problem of carbon dating. It is all based on unknown parameter, the speed of decay of carbon. take you briefly to that point back in time when the fraudulent Scaligarian history was imposed upon humanity with military power. Those were very turbulent times for Europe. The royal dynasties were changing one after another. For example, in England, the Tudors were replaced 
by the Stuarts, the France, the throne was taken by the Bourbons. In Russia, the traditional Rurik dynasty was replaced by the Romanovs, who actually did not have any right to be on the throne. On the background, all these events were orchestrated by the parasites who were applying the method divide and conquer. By that time, they managed to successfully lower the consciousness of the human race to the point that there was no need to kill them anymore. The people started killing each other. The actual intention and events of the Reformation are not the ones we hear about today. They are distorted and the proof of that is the very inconsistent story that we hear nowadays. We are being told that the main reason for the revolt of the people was the unlimited power of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, as far as the popes being unpopular, that is absolutely true. However, as far as any actual uh, ruling power is concerned, they didn't seem to have much of that at this point of time. In Spain, in the 15th century, even before the Reformation period started, the authority over the Inquisition was handed over to the king. In year 1515, the French king uh, was victorious in a battle against the allied forces of the popes and Switzerland. After that, the French king had the full right to appoint the clergy and to manage its finances. In more simple terms, he had full control over it. From that time on, even the Pope himself was obliged to consult the French king even when taking decisions concerning his own domain. And even the official version of history agrees with uh, the facts I just uh, told you. Moreover, they tell us that at that time the clergy were as rich as uh, beggars. Often they had to sell cattle to have uh, something to eat. So all this uh, talk of the unlimited uh, power of the Pope is just baloney because at this point, even according to the official history, he did not have uh, much uh, social uh, influence or uh, any other as well as a matter of fact. Since the first official reason for the reformation is no good, let's see if the others will make more sense. Martin Luther. He is uh, considered to be a seminal figure in the reformation process. So, uh, he thought Christianity should be nearer to the simple folks and he translated the Bible from Latin to understandable German language. And also he convinced the people that there should be no images in the churches, no statues of the saints. Also, there should be no organ music during uh, church services and also a ringing of the church bells. So, we are offered to believe that because of not liking organ music or church bells during service, the result was Complete devastation of entire regions. Famine and disease wiping out most of the population of entire countries. War bankrupting most of the combatant powers. Severe hardship on the inhabitants of occupied territories and one of the longest, most destructive series of wars in European history lasting for 30 years. And do you believe that people did all this because of the style of music being played in the churches? But let's get back to the list of official reasons for the Reformation. The next one is that people felt nostalgia for the old and pure form of Christianity. They wanted to reinstitute it again. That is one beautiful and elegant intellectual concept. However, intellectuals write books and envision educational projects. While those who care not for books go to the battlefield. When a peasant upheaval, peasant revolt in Germany started, the very founder of uh, the Protestant movement, Martin Luther, 
did not support it. He was himself preaching that the peasants should always, under all circumstances, obey their masters. And here is a confirmation of his views in action taken again on from the mainstream history. He ordered uh, the governors at that time to kill the peasants who were revolting, quote, like dogs that are sick of rabies. So the more we read, the more we understand that it wasn't Martin Luther who caused this most bloody series of war. It wasn't the church music either or the statues of saints in the churches. Since the realism for these most bloody wars is very uncomfortable for the fabricated history, mainstream historians are trying to invent all kinds of artificial reasons for it and one of it is a real masterpiece of human stupidity. This is how some modern historians are trying to explain the bloody conflict between Czechs and Germans during the Reformation. Too much masculine energy was boiling in their veins and they had no outlet of this energy. I think this is a masterpiece of concoction. By the time this particular conflict was over, the population of Czech Republic had decreased few times. And then their energy stopped boiling and that's why they stopped fighting. Reformation was a very long and very bloody war. It was a purely political event. Why are modern historians trying to present it to us as some sort of intellectual dream about organ music and statues in the temples? The reason, the actual reason, is that all this war was about the parasites trying to break into pieces the empire of the descendants of the survivors and then destroy these pieces one by one. The parasites want the war, but they wanted to get sure that the empire and the knowledge of the survivors will be never resurrected. And for that they decided to fabricate fraudulent history and in that fraudulent history they did not even mention the very existence of the empire. The rest of this documentary will be about the empire of the descendants of the survivors who kept the history about them alive, they remembered who they are and they had still a great deal of the knowledge that survived.